the Michigan murders were a series of highly publicized killings of young women committed between 1967 and 1969 in the Ann Arbor, Ypsilanti area of southeastern Michigan by an individual known as the Ypsilanti Ripper, the Michigan Murderer, and the Coed Killer. All the victims of the Michigan murders were young women between the ages of 13 and 21 who were abducted, raped, beaten and murdered, typically by stabbing or strangulation, with their bodies occasionally mutilated after death before being discarded within a 15-mile radius of Washtenaw County. The perpetrator, John Norman Chapman, then known as John Norman Collins, was arrested one week after the final murder. He was sentenced to life imprisonment for this final murder attributed to the Michigan murderer on August 19, 1970, and is currently incarcerated at Marquette Branch Prison. Although never tried for the remaining five murders attributed to the Michigan murderer, or the murder of a sixth girl killed in California whose death has been linked to this series, Investigators believe Chapman to be responsible for all seven murders linked to the same perpetrator. Murders First Known Victim The first known victim linked to the Michigan murderer was a 19-year-old Eastern Michigan University accounting student named Mary Terry's Flesh R. Her nude body was found by two 15-year-old boys on an abandoned farm in Superior Township on August 7, and was formally identified via dental records the following day. The corpse was badly decomposed. Although the pathologist who examined Flesh R's remains was able to determine the young woman had been stabbed approximately 30 times in the chest and abdomen with a knife or other sharp object, that her feet had been severed just above the ankle, the thumb and sections of the fingers of one hand were missing and that one forearm had been severed from her body. These severed appendages were never found. Despite the advanced state of decomposition, the pathologist was also able to locate multiple lineal abrasions upon the victim's chest and torso. A detailed examination of the crime scene revealed that the body had been moved three times. Throughout the month it had lain undiscovered. Two days after the remains had been identified as those of Mary Fleshar, a young man claiming to be a friend of the Fleshar family arrived at the funeral home holding Fleshar's body prior to her scheduled burial. This individual had asked for permission to take a photograph of the body as it lay in the coffin, as a keepsake for Fleshar's parents. When informed his request was impossible, sternly informed a second time he would not be allowed to view the body. The young man had wordlessly exited the funeral home. The receptionist could not offer any clear description of the man beyond that he was handsome, young white male with dark hair, that he had driven a blue-gray Chevrolet, and that he had not been carrying a camera. Subsequent Murders Almost one year later, on July 5th, 1968, the partially decomposed, mutilated body of a 20-year-old art student named Joan Elspeth Skell. The lack of blood beneath or near the corpse, plus the testimony of eyewitnesses, led investigators to determine Shell's body had lain in its present location for less than 24 hours. Her murderer had likely driven to the location to dispose of her body before making rudimentary efforts to conceal the body with clumps of grass. In addition, the outstanding similarities between the wounds inflicted upon her body and those inflicted upon Mary Flesh are the previous year led investigators to establish a definite connection between both murders, and four detectives were assigned to work full-time on both cases. Skelha hailed from Plymouth. Michigan and had recently moved into a house on Emmett Street in Ypsilanti. She was last seen by her roommate, Susan Colby, at a Washtenaw Avenue bus stop on the evening of June 30. Skell had intended to travel to Ann Arbor to visit her boyfriend, and her roommate had accompanied her to the bus stop. Colby later stated she had attempted to dissuade Skell from entering this vehicle, 
but that Skell had opted to accept the driver's offer, promising to call her roommate to assure her of her safety once she reached her boyfriend's Ann Arbor residence. Less than three hours later, Colby reported her roommate missing after failing to receive any contact. Despite tracing and eliminating more than 150 registered owners of red and black vehicles in the state of Michigan, and establishing the alibis of numerous individuals whose physical features bore a likeness to the composite drawing of the driver the police had obtained from Shell's roommate. All investigative lines of inquiry into the murder of Joan Skell failed to bear fruition. On August 18, investigators announced that all significant leads had been exhausted, and that the number of officers assigned to investigate the case had been reduced. Two months after the murder of Joan Skell, police inquiries produced two further eyewitnesses who stated they had observed Skell walking with a young man along Emmett Street on the evening she disappeared. Although neither eyewitness was certain, both believed this student to be John Norman Collins, a student at Eastern Michigan University majoring in elementary education and whose physical features bore a likeness to the composite drawing police had generated of the driver of the vehicle Skell had entered. Questioned by police, Collins flatly denied even knowing Joan Skell and insisted he had spent the weekend of June 29, 30 with his mother at her house in the Detroit suburb of Center Line, and had not returned to Ypsilanti until the morning of July 1. Initially, police took him at his word, and did not seek to verify his alibi. Spring 1969 On March 20, 1969, despite the fact Mixer had not been subjected to a sexual assault, the fact her tights had been lowered to expose her thighs and sanitary towel suggested a sexual motive behind the murder. Four days after the discovery of the body of Jane Mixer, on March 25th, a surveyor discovered the nude, mutilated body of a teenage girl behind a vacant house on a remote, rural section of Earhart Road. The victim was identified as a 16-year-old Romulus. Formation of Coordinated Task Force Following the March 24 murder of Marilyn Skelton, police from the five separate jurisdictions where the murderer had abducted or disposed of the Bodies of his victims formally combined resources in an effort to compare information and identify the perpetrator. Although investigators had informally exchanged information with agencies from other jurisdictions on an irregular basis since the previous summer, no coordinated efforts to combine efforts and resources had ensued until the discovery of the third victim definitely linked to the series. Little physical evidence existed beyond eyewitness descriptions and forensic reports. Police had noted, and would continue to note, common denominators in the physical characteristics of the victims, and the manner in which they died. All of the victims had been brunette Caucasians. Each, excluding Mixer, had been the recipient of extensive violence inflicted with a blunt and or bladed instrument prior to her murder. Each of the victims' bodies had been found within a 15-mile radius of Washtenaw County, and each victim, again excluding Mixer, had received knife wounds to the neck. Furthermore, each victim had been found with an item of clothing tied around her neck, and each woman had been menstruating at the time of her death. Fifth and Sixth Murders At 6.30 a.m. on April 16, the body of a 13-year-old Ypsilanti schoolgirl named Don Louise Bassam was found discarded beside a desolate road in Ypsilanti, clothed only in a white blouse and bra, which had been pushed around her neck. She had been repeatedly stabbed in the chest and genitals. Investigators found no definite evidence Bassam had been subjected to a sexual assault prior to her murder. Bassam had last been seen alive at 7.30 p.m. the previous evening, walking home from a friend's house located barely a mile from her own home. 
Police diagram released to the news media June 10, 1969, depicting the locations of the first five victims linked to the Michigan murderer. The orange mohair sweater belonging to the victim was found in a deserted farmhouse just 100 yards from the desolate road on which her body had been placed after her murder. Glass particles found within this basement were of a similar consistency to those found upon the soles of Bassam's shoes. Upon conducting a search of the basement of this farmhouse, investigators discovered a further garment of her clothing, a length of electrical flex of the same type used to strangle the victim, and fresh human blood stains, indicating this location as being the site of Bassam's murder. One week after the murder of Don Bassam, a detective conducting a routine examination of this farmhouse basement discovered a scrap of cloth from Bassam's blouse, plus an earring later determined to belong to Marilyn Skelton. Each item had been deliberately placed in this location, indicating that the murderer had returned to the scene of the crime, and a definite link between both homicides. Less than two months after the murder of Don Bassam, on June 9, three teenage boys discovered a partially nude body of a young woman in a field close to an abandoned farmhouse on North Territorial Road. The victim had received multiple slash and stab wounds to the body, including two stab wounds which had pierced her heart. The victim was identified the following day had last been seen shortly after noon on her way to a downtown wig shop. Three days after the disappearance of Bane Man, her nude body was discovered face down in a wooded gully alongside the Huron River Parkway. A medical examination revealed Bainman had been extensively beaten about the face and body, with some lacerations inflicted being so severe sections of skin had been removed, exposing subcutaneous tissues. She had received extensive skull and brain injuries which had been inflicted with a blunt instrument, had been forced to ingest a caustic substance, as had been the case with previous victims. Her killer had placed a section of cloth in her throat to muffle her screams throughout her torture. Bainman had died of strangulation. Although the pathologist noted the blunt force injuries inflicted to her skull and brain had been so extensive they would likely have proven fatal. The forensic examination of Bainman's body further revealed she had been raped prior to her murder and that her torn panties had been forcefully placed inside her vagina. These panties revealed the presence of human semen and 509. Mindful of the fact the killer had evidently returned to sites of his previous murders to move the bodies, possibly in a sexual ritual, police theorized the killer may also attempt to return to this latest crime scene. Although earlier attempts to enforce news blackouts as to the discovery of victims down Bassam and Alice Colomb had proven unsuccessful at approximately 2 a.m. Investigation Upon retracing Karen Sue Bainman's movements on the day of her disappearance, police questioned the proprietor of the wig shop Bainman had visited immediately prior to her disappearance, a Mrs. Diana Joan Ghosh. Ghosh recalled Bainman visiting her store to purchase a $20 headpiece in the early afternoon of July 23. She also recalled having observed a young man with short, side parted dark hair, wearing a horizontal striped sweater, waiting on a blue motorcycle outside the shop at Bainman made her purchase, before stating, I've got to be either the bravest or the dumbest girl alive because I've just accepted a ride from this guy. Mrs. Ghosh then observed Bainman climb onto the motorcycle before the young man with whom she had accepted the ride drove away. Although Mrs. Ghosh would initially, and incorrectly, describe the motorcycle as being possibly a Honda 350 model, the description of the young man with whom Bainman had last been seen alive was heard by patrolman named Larry Mathewson, who believed the person described by Mrs. Ghosh and others may be one John Norman Collins, a former fraternity member of his who had previously been interviewed but eliminated from police inquiries.
Police had already established that Collins was a known motorcycle enthusiast. If a person wants something, he alone is the deciding factor of whether or not to take it. Regardless of what society thinks is right or wrong, if a person holds a gun on somebody, it's up to him to decide whether to take the other's life or not. The point is, it's not society's judgment that's important, but the individual's own choice of will and intellect. Quote, Evaluation of Individual Will and Moral Restraints Within Society Written by Collins while enrolled at Eastern Michigan University. Collins had established a reputation among his peers at Eastern Michigan University as a habitual thief who had been evicted from a fraternity house in which he had previously resided following allegations of his stealing from his roommates. Upon questioning Collins' co-workers, investigators learned that Collins had repeatedly taken delight in describing, in graphic detail, details of the injuries inflicted upon each successive victim linked to the Michigan murderer to his female colleagues. He had claimed these details had been provided to him by an uncle of his named David Lake, who served as a sergeant in the police force. The injuries described by Collins were consistent with those inflicted upon the victims which had not been disclosed to the news media, and David Lake would inform investigators that he had not disclosed any information regarding the Michigan murders to his nephew. Investigators also ascertained Collins had either been acquainted with most of the victims, had currently or previously lived close to their place of residence, or had likely established possible prior contact prior to their murder. In the case of victims Mary Fleshar and Joan Skell, investigators were able to establish she had been a neighbor of both women. Suspect Identification and Questioning Following her identification of a photograph of Collins, police further questioned the proprietor of the wig shop in which Bainman had last been seen alive, asking her to identify the man she had seen with Bainman in a police lineup. In this lineup, Mrs. Ghosh positively identified the man she had seen with Karen Sue Bainman as John Norman Collins. On Sunday, July 27, police arrived at the apartment on Emmett Street Collins shared with his roommate, Arnold Davis. Although Collins emphatically protested his innocence and insisted the eyewitnesses identification of him had been an error, he refused to return to the police station to take a polygraph test. The following evening, Davis observed Collins emerging from his bedroom carrying a box partially covered by a blanket. As Davis opened the door for his roommate to leave the apartment, he observed that the contents of this box included a purple woman's shoe, rolled up jean-like material, and a burlap purse. Later that evening, Collins informed Davis he had simply decided to get rid of the box and its contents. Arrest Collins' uncle, State Police Sergeant David Lake, had been on vacation with his family at the time of Bainman's disappearance, and had only returned home on July 29, three days after the discovery of her body. Throughout their vacation, Collins had been temporarily residing in the Lake family's Ypsilanti home, having been granted sole access to the house in order that he could feed their German shepherd. The basement of SGT, Lake's home was subjected to an intense forensic examination, although forensic experts would deduce later that morning that the stains covered by the black paint had actually been varnish stains. One of the investigators discovered numerous hair clippings, many measuring less than three-eighths of an inch, aside the family washing machine. The hairs found upon Bainman's panties and those recovered from the basement of the lake home were subjected to a detailed forensic neutron analysis. Questioning of Lake's neighbors yielded additional circumstantial evidence. One neighbor, Marjorie Barnes, recalled having witnessed Collins leaving his uncle's home with a deluxe laundry detergent box. Prior to the Lake family returning from their vacation, another neighbor informed investigators she had heard the muffled screams of a young female 
emanating from the lake household on the evening of Bainman's disappearance. The same afternoon, police searched the lake family's basement. Collins was confronted with evidence thus far gained and deduced. Although Collins burst into tears when informed the stains on the floor covered with paint had been varnish, he quickly regained his composure and continued to deny any knowledge of Karen Subainman. Later that day, having received initial laboratory reports indicating the hair samples recovered from Bainman's panties matched those discovered in Lake's basement, and that the blood stains recovered from this location were of the same type as hers. Arraignment John Norman Collins Pictured at his arraignment for the murder of Karen Subainman August 1, 1969 On August 1, 1969, John Norman Collins was formally arraigned for the murder of Karen Subainman. He was held without bond. Pre-trial hearings On August 14, 1969, Collins attended a pre-trial hearing at Ypsilanti District Court. After hearing six hours of testimony from nine prosecution witnesses, Judge Edward Deke ruled that probable cause had been established, and Collins was formally ordered to stand trial for Bainman's murder. At a second hearing in September, Collins refused to enter a plea. Washtenaw County Circuit Court Judge John Conlin ordered a plea of not guilty entered on his behalf. At this hearing, Collins' court-appointed attorney, Richard Ryan, challenged the validity of the physical evidence and the credibility of the circumstantial evidence before formally requesting the case against his client be dismissed and the evidence seized from his rooming house and vehicle suppressed upon the grounds Collins had not consented to a police search of his property. Ryan further stated at this hearing he was undecided as to whether the upcoming trial be held away from the Ann Arbor Ypsilanti district due to pre-trial publicity, and this final motion was held in abeyance until an impartial jury could be selected. On October 14, Judge Conlin rejected defense motions to dismiss the case, or suppress any evidence obtained, ruling Collins' arrest had been on the reasonable grounds he had committed a felony. Independent Polygraph Test In November, Ryan, in an effort to determine the most effective defense strategy, persuaded Collins to undergo a private and independent polygraph test. Prosecutor William F. Bell he agreed to a proviso that the test be conducted off the record and its results remain confidential. In January 1970, Neil Fink and Joseph Louisel, partners at one of Detroit's highest-priced law firms, agreed to take over Collins' defense. Trial The trial of John Norman Collins for the murder of Karen Sue Bainman began in the Washtenaw County court building on June 2, 1970. Initial jury selection began on this date, and would continue until July 9. Several motions by the defense counsel throughout the jury selection process that the trial should be moved to a jurisdiction outside of Washtenaw County were rejected by Judge John Conlin, who ruled on June 29 that the 14 members of the jury selected from Ann Arbor by this date and considered satisfactory by both counsels would serve as jurors throughout the trial. Upon recommendation from his lawyers, Collins chose not to testify in his own defense. The prosecutors at Collins' trial, William Delhi and Booker Williams, opted to charge Collins only with the murder of Karen Subainman, with the state contending that she had been murdered by Collins in the basement of the lake household. The two primary questions before the jury, Delhi stated, would be the accuracy of eyewitnesses who would be called to testify and, ultimately, whether the more than 500 hair samples found upon Bainman's panties matched the hair clippings, later recovered from the basement of Collins' uncle. Delhi also stated the prosecution's intent to prove that Collins had had sole access to his uncle's home and basement on the afternoon of Bainman's disappearance. 
and although he had made concerted efforts to remove physical evidence from the crime scene, blood samples recovered from this location were a match for the blood type of the victim. Delhi formally closed his opening statement to the jury by requesting they return a verdict of life imprisonment with no possibility of parole. The death sentence was not an option for the prosecution to seek as Michigan had legislatively abolished the death penalty for murder in 1846. The defense contended that although the murder of Bainman was a vicious, sadistic attack which had degraded her body almost beyond human comprehension, quote, witness testimony. Formal witness testimony began on July 20, 1970. The first two witnesses to testify were Bainman's two roommates each of whom discussed Bainman's character and her movements on the day of her disappearance. These two witnesses were followed by the individual who had found her body on July 26, and the medical examiner called to the crime scene, Dr. Craig Barlow. Barlow testified as to the fact that although Bainman had been deceased for almost 72 hours, her body had only lain in the location where she was found for 24 hours before discovery. Furthermore, Ghosh had identified a photograph shown to her of Collins as being the man she had seen with Bainman. To expand on their allegations that certain defense witnesses had been subjected to police harassment, and that eyewitness accounts had been flawed. Defense attorney Joseph Louis L. subjected Sheriff Harvey to a 45-minute cross-examination as to his contact with the two eyewitnesses prior to completion of this composite drawing. In this cross-examination, Sheriff Harvey admitted to having driven Mrs. Ghosh and her assistant to East Lansing to view the updated composite drawing of the suspect in Bainman's murder, and that he had shown photographs of various suspects including Collins, to Ghosh prior to her formally identifying Collins in a lineup. Three days after both counsels had begun introducing witnesses, Joan Ghosh was called to testify on behalf of the prosecution. In response to questioning from prosecution attorneys, Ghosh described how, on the afternoon of her disappearance, Bainman had informed her she had accepted a lift home from the man waiting outside the wig shop, when asked to formally identify the individual upon whose motorcycle she had observed waiting outside her shop. Although subject to intense cross-examination by defense attorney Neil Fink as to the credibility of her testimony, Ghosh remained insistent in her identification of John Norman Collins as being the individual who had waited for Karen Sue Bainman to return to his motorcycle. In an effort to discredit Ghosh's testimony, Fink diverted questioning as to the model of motorcycle she had seen outside her shop, to which Ghosh conceded her initial belief as to the model being a Honda 350 was inaccurate. In response to questions as to her personal character, Ghosh further conceded she had previously lied under oath on two occasions, one instance of which was unrelated to the trial. On July 27, Arnold Davies testified as to his being in the company of Collins throughout the late afternoon and evening of July 23, 1969, hours after Bainman had last been seen alive. The following day, following a consultation with opposing counsels, Judge John Conlin allowed Davis to testify as to having observed Collins hurriedly remove a laundry box containing women's clothing and jewelry from his apartment and place this box in the trunk of his car two days prior to his arrest. Also to testify at the trial on behalf of the prosecution was Marjorie Barnes, who testified on July 30th to having observed Collins leaving his uncle's home carrying a laundry box covered with a blanket on either July 24th or 25, 1969. No full fingerprints had been discovered in the basement, which had not belonged to any Lake family member. On July 31st, the prosecution introduced two forensic witnesses to testify regarding the physical evidence, indicating the victim had been killed inside the Lake family home. 
The first witness to testify was the head of the Michigan Health Department's Crime Detective Laboratory, Walter Holes, who testified as to the human hair clippings found inside Karen Subainman's panties being an exact match to those recovered from the basement of SGT. David Lake, the 47th and final witness to appear for the prosecution at Collins' trial was a University of California chemistry professor named Drive, Vincent P. Ginn, who testified on August 5 as to his conclusions that the hair samples retrieved from Bainman's panties bore a remarkable similarity to those retrieved from the Lake household and that, upon statistical calculations he had begun the previous month, the odds of erroneous matching of the hair samples earlier testified to by Walter Holes were considerably low. Upon cross-examination, Dr. Ginn did agree with defense attorney Neil Fink that a statistical analysis of hair mixtures had never been attempted in a court of law. Defense Witnesses Five independent witnesses were called to testify on behalf of the defense as to Collins. Whereabouts on the dates Karen Subainman had disappeared and her body had been found. Four of these witnesses were employees of a motorcycle sales firm which Collins had visited on the afternoon of Bainman's disappearance. Each testified on August 6. The timing of these four witnesses' recollections as to when Collins had actually entered the motorcycle shop varied slightly. Although consensus among three of these men was that he had entered the premises as they were eating lunch, which they typically did any time between 1 and 2 p.m. Upon cross-examination, the time factor of these witnesses as to when they had actually seen Collins expanded to between noon and 2 p.m. Two of these employees had signed statements affirming the time Collins had entered their premises was approximately 2 p.m., although one of these witnesses stated he had been repeatedly harassed by an Ann Arbor police sergeant as to the actual time he had seen Collins. On August 8, Collins' attorneys introduced a renowned neutron analyst named Drive, Robert Jervis in an effort to discredit the earlier testimony of the forensic experts who had testified on behalf of the prosecution. Dr. Jervis testified as to his belief that insufficient chemical samples had existed in the samples retrieved from the basement, which the prosecution scientists had worked with to form their conclusions, and that to form a conclusive neutron activation analysis, at least 10 components in a hair sample must be compared, whereas only 5 components had been used by the prosecution's forensics experts to determine their findings. The forensic experts who had testified on behalf of the prosecution, Dr. Jervis stated, had therefore based their conclusions on insufficient data. Closing Arguments On August 13, both prosecution and defense attorneys delivered their closing arguments to the jury. These arguments concluded the following day. Following the state's closing argument, both Neil Fink and Joseph Louisel delivered separate closing arguments on behalf of the defense, describing Collins as a young victim of circumstances and dismissing much of the evidence presented as fuzzy allegations, with Louisel being particularly scornful as to the testimony of Walter Holes, to whose conclusions he asserted the prosecution hinged its entire case. In a brief final argument on behalf of the prosecution, Booker Williams re-emphasized the physical and circumstantial evidence against Collins, before accusing the defense attorneys of attempting to sow doubt in, particularly, the forensic evidence presented by the prosecution. In a final address to the jury on August 14, Judge Conlin informed the panel they had two choices in the verdict they could render guilty of first-degree murder, or not guilty. Conviction and Incarceration On August 19, 1970, John Norman Collins was unanimously found guilty of the first-degree murder of Karen Subainman. He remained impassive upon hearing the jury foreman announce the verdict. 
although many spectators gasped audibly. I have two things to say. I think they conscientiously tried to give me a fair trial. The jury did not take its task lightly. But, I think things were blown out of proportion. The circumstances surrounding this case prevented me from getting a fair trial. It was a travesty of justice that took place in this courtroom. I hope someday it will be corrected. Second, I never knew a girl named Karen Subainman. I never had a conversation with her. I never took her to a wig shop. I never took her to my uncle's home. I never took her life. Collins was then informed by Judge Conlin that if the juror's verdict was wrong, the error would be corrected in due course. He was then sentenced to serve a term of life imprisonment with hard labor, in solitary confinement, at Southern Michigan Prison. Upon receipt of the guilty verdict against their client, Collins' defense attorneys announced their intention to appeal upon the grounds of tainted identification and the change of venue question. Quote, Post-sentencing appeals Between 1972 and 1976, Collins appealed his murder conviction on four further occasions, citing contentions that the Michigan murders had received extensive media publicity in Washtenaw County, and that five separate motions for change of venue had been submitted by the defense counsel two of which had been filed throughout the actual jury selection process, upon the grounds of pretrial publicity minimizing any chance of obtaining an unbiased jury in Washtenaw County. Each motion filed had been reserved or, in the final instance, denied. His lawyers further argued that, at an evidentiary hearing in April 1970, shortly before jury selection had begun, Collins' indictment for the California murder of Roxy Ann Phillips had likewise received extensive media coverage in Washtenaw County, further reducing the chances of potential jurors being unbiased. Moreover, a psychologist retained by the defense had testified as such on April 20, 1970. This psychologist had been adamant that Collins' trial should be held outside Washtenaw County and this motion had likewise been reserved. Furthermore, Collins' lawyers argued issues such as the admissibility of testimony relating to the microscopic analysis of hair samples presented at his trial, and the denial of defense motions to suppress prosecution witnesses testifying against their client. In each appeal instance, Collins' conviction was upheld with successive appellate judges of the Supreme Court announcing in October 1974 their refusal to review his conviction. At his 1972 appeal hearing, Collins' lawyers did succeed in securing the partial striking of the testimony of Dr. Vincent P. Ginn, the final prosecution witness at his trial who had testified as to the odds of erroneous matching of the hairs found upon Karan Bainman's panties to those in the Lake family basement being more than a million to one. Quote. Subsequent developments Waiver of California extradition At the time of his 1970 conviction, a grand jury indictment against Collins remained outstanding in relation to the June 1969, murder of Roxy Ann Phillips in Monterey, California. The physical and circumstantial evidence linking Collins to this particular murder was stronger than any of the six outstanding murders then linked to him in Michigan. And authorities in Monterey did file several motions to extradite Collins to California to stand trial for Phillips' murder in 1970 and 1971. These motions were repeatedly contested by Collins' attorney, Neil Fink, who opposed and successfully delayed his client's extradition upon the grounds of due process. The state of California postponed their requests to extradite Collins to face charges relating to Phillips' murder in June 1971, citing Collins' then ongoing appeals against his convictions in the state of Michigan as the cause and their likely resubmittal should any of his Michigan appeals be successful. Evidence of culpability in remaining cases 
although never tried for the murders of flesh are Skell, Skelton, Bassam, Colom or Phillips. Physical and circumstantial evidence exists in each case indicating that Collins had indeed committed these murders. For example, in the case of Mary Fleshar, investigators discovered that at the time of her disappearance, Collins had worked part-time in the Eastern Michigan University Administration Unit, and that his office had been located directly opposite the hallway from the office where Fleshar had herself worked. One of the personal items missing from Fleshar's body was an Expo 67 Canadian silver dollar she is known to have worn around her neck. This item was discovered in Collins' dresser when police conducted a search of his room. When confronted with this finding, Collins reportedly denied any knowledge of the existence of this item and insisted it had never been in his room. He had apparently neglected to dispose of this item as he had the personal possessions of other victims two days prior to his arrest. McKenney Hall, Eastern Michigan University, Joan Skell was last seen by her roommate entering a vehicle with a man matching Collins' description at this location on June 30, 1968. In the case of Joan Elspeth Skell, Two separate witness accounts had placed the victim both entering a car with three men on the night of her disappearance, and walking alone in the company of a man believed to be John Collins later that evening. One of the men in the car Skell had entered was Collins' roommate, Arnold Davis, who later informed police the girl had indeed entered the car he had been driving, but that Collins had insisted he give Skell the lift she was seeking to Ann Arbor in his own car. Collins and Skell had alighted from Davis's car together, and he, Davis, had not seen his roommate for almost three hours before Collins had returned to their apartment, alone, referring to Skell as a bitch, and claiming he had dropped her. The circumstantial evidence linking Collins to Shell's abduction and murder was stronger than that of any other Michigan victim linked to him, and police would formally announce this fact within days of his arrest. Nonetheless, the decision of the prosecution at his 1970 trial was to try Collins solely with the murder of Karen Sue Bainman. Arnold Davis also informed police Collins had been in the company of victim Alice Colom on the evening of her disappearance. According to Davis, he had heard Collins and Colom arguing behind closed doors before Colom had run out of his Collins apartment, with Collins chasing after her. Collins had returned to their shared apartment shortly thereafter and asked Davis to hide a knife for him. Davis had reported this incident to police, and later handed them the knife Collins had allegedly asked him to hide. Investigators determined the knife was consistent with the weapon used to stab Colomb. In the case of California victim Roxy Ann Phillips, police had discovered that, prior to her murder, the victim had told a close friend she had met an Eastern Michigan University student named John who owned a silver Oldsmobile Cutlass and several motorcycles. Her nude, strangled body was found discarded in a patch of poison oak on July 13, with the distinctive red and white floral patterned belt from her culotte dress knotted around her neck. Following Collins' arrest, a section of a red and white belt bearing the same distinctive floral pattern was found in the trailer he and Manuel had towed to Salinas on June 21. Investigative Error Three days prior to Collins' July 30 arrest, in direct breach of a Washtenaw County prosecutor order, Collins had protested his innocence on this occasion, and insisted the eyewitnesses' identifications of him had been erroneous although he refused to return to the police station to take a polygraph test. No search warrant had been sought prior to Collins being questioned on this date, and his apartment would only be searched on July 30th. Two days after Arnold Davis had observed Collins hurriedly remove a box of women's clothing and jewelry from his apartment, had this violation of the county prosecutor's order not taken place. 
Collins may not have realized how seriously he was considered a suspect at that stage and thus may not have disposed of the physical evidence which would have assisted in linking him to other killings linked to the Michigan murders. Aftermath In the years immediately following his conviction, Collins' mother, siblings and several of his friends remained steadfast in their belief that Collins had been the victim of a miscarriage of justice. While incarcerated at Southern Michigan Prison, he received regular visits from family and friends. Collins' mother, Loretta, and his two siblings, Jerry and Gail, refused to speak with SGT. David Blake and his wife, Sandra, following their testimony against Collins at his trial, despite the evident distress of Sandra Lake throughout her testimony, during which she had testified that Collins had been as close to me as her own sons. For several years following his incarceration, Collins refused to grant interviews to the media, but six years after his conviction, Collins formally requested a personal interview with reporters from the Ann Arbor News. In this interview, Collins vehemently denied his guilt in any of the Michigan murders. He asserted that key evidence attesting to his innocence had been suppressed by the prosecution team at his 1970 trial, that the jury had been biased and the scientific testimony related to blood and hair comparisons had been invalid. In October, 1977, Collins was transferred from Southern Michigan Prison to Marquette Branch Prison, a more secure facility, due to Collins' repeated dealing in contraband drugs, and his conspiring with a fellow inmate to escape. Collins was unable to participate in the actual successful escape due to a broken foot. In 1980, Collins legally changed his surname to that of his biological father, Chapman. The following year, he formally requested transfer to a Canadian prison, in the belief this would facilitate his prospects of eventual release. Chapman holds dual citizenship and under Canadian law, would then have been eligible for parole after serving just nine years in Canada. His application was granted, then reversed in the wake of public outrage. Despite repeatedly challenging the overturning of the 1981 decision to transfer him to a Canadian prison, a federal appellate court ruled in May 1988 that Chapman should remain incarcerated at Marquette Branch Prison. In September 1988, Chapman agreed to participate in a live interview conducted by Detroit-based talk show Kelly and Company to discuss his conviction for security reasons. This proposed live interview was cancelled, although Chapman agreed to submit to a filmed interview. In this interview, he again denied culpability for any of the Michigan murders, and insisted the prosecution case against him was flawed. Chapman was transferred to the Ionia Correctional Facility in August 1990. He would later be returned to Marquette Branch Prison. On July 11, 2005, a 62-year-old former nurse named Gary Earl Leiterman was charged with the murder of Jane Louise Mixer. Chapman is currently serving his life sentence in administrative segregation at Marquette Branch Prison. Media Film An unreleased movie, Now I Lay Me Down to Sleep, draws direct inspiration from Edward Key's book, The Michigan Murders. Books B.U.H.K. Tobin, True Crime, Michigan, The State's Most Notorious Criminal Cases, Stackpole Books, ISBN 0-8117-0713-X, Fournier, Gregory, Terror in Ypsilanti, John Norman Collins Unmasked, Wheatmark, ISBN 978-1-627-87-403-8, James, Earl, Catching Serial Killers, Learning from Past Serial Murder Investigations, International Forensic Services, ISBN 0-9629-7140-5, Wilson, Colin, Seaman, Donald, Encyclopedia of Modern Murder, 
1962-1982. Bonanza Books. ISBN 978-0-517-66559-6. Television. Detroit-based talk show Kelly and Company broadcast an episode focusing on the Michigan murders in October 1988. This episode featured pre-recorded prison interviews with Collins himself in addition to live interviews with police and legal personnel connected to the case. The Investigation Discovery Channel has broadcast an episode focusing upon the Michigan murders. This episode, A New Kind of Monster, was first broadcast December 10, 2013 as part of the series A Crime to Remember.